Hello and welcome to Metro AV Tech Tips. I'm Brent and replacing Adam today is... Hi Brent, thanks for having me. Jason Dustel from Meridio. I'm and also an ISF instructor. Okay, I'm glad you got that in. Which is the reason why we're here. <laughs> now, honestly, Adam was supposed to be here with us today, yeah. but something came up, so he got booted, so it's just you and I, so hey. I'm hoping you're entertaining and hey, funny. it's party time. Because I'm the good looking one. <laughs> so, I will not argue with that. <laughs> Die holla. So, let's start with the basics. Sure. Tell everybody who you are, yep. what you do, and what ISF is for those who do not know. Okay, cool. Uh, I'm Jason Dussel uh, with Meridio. Uh, we make some of these cool little test pieces that um, you guys use a lot of and a lot of installers out there in the field. Um, I, uh, I'm an ISF instructor and we travel around and we teach integrators, uh, reviewers, uh, commercial installers, anybody that has anything to do with installing a display. We teach them how to fine tune it to make sure it's performing its best and it in a lot of cases in commercial environments, make sure they all look the same. But at the end of the day, what our goal is, is to uh, preserve the intent of the content creators who are making TV shows and films and video games and things like that. And what we found over the years, and the reason ISF exists is because the way displays come from the factory, they're not quite preserving the director's intent of the content. And for various reasons, which I'm sure we'll get into today, but um, yeah, uh, we, we use a bunch of really cool tools, which we'll talk about. And we use our eyeballs quite a lot with some test patterns from some of these pieces of equipment that you guys are familiar with. And uh, again, the whole entire point is to preserve artist intent and to make sure the TV or projector is tuned for the room that it's in, the screen that it's shining on, the lighting conditions, where somebody sits. It's all completely custom, which makes it a lot of fun. Well, and I, looking at the tools you have with you, I mean, other than these, which obviously... Yeah, you guys know I know those. well. Yeah. <laughs> Very well. Yeah. Um, I've known Joel and you for quite a while, sure. and the tools are a whole lot more streamlined than they used to yes, be. Yes, absolutely. Um, when I started, uh, it was, I, I always say this, and it's kind of funny, but when I started, it's like we were cavemen hitting the TV with a stick and going into service menus, blowing things up. Um, luckily, I came in at the tail end of CRT, so I didn't really have to mess with it that much, but it was literally dangerous to calibrate a TV in those days. They were lining the inside of the cabinets with duvetine and trapping in all the heat and weird things happened after that. But nowadays, man, some of these tools are super affordable. Um, the software is really easy to use. The, the TV has all the controls that you need for the most part. Um, in some cases, you can lock the controls so somebody can't come in behind you and, and, and wreck everything. But well, I am a big fan of Sony Pro Mode. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it, it's, it's awesome stuff. And uh, speaking of that point, um, what we're constantly trying to match is the Sony Professional Monitor that you see in all right. the studios. Uh, and for those of you who might not know, Sony makes a reference monitor. So if you're, let's just say Netflix, for example, and you have a colorist color grading a movie and, and, and mastering the movie, um, they're looking at a reference monitor, usually by Sony, um, the newest model is the BVM HX310. And what we're really trying to do in somebody's home is match that monitor as close as we can. Because again, if, you're, if, if the colorist and the artist is looking at that display, making the movie or TV show look a certain way, why don't we honor that art form of film and, and TV production and just see it the right way? And I have the Salvador Dali Museum right by me in downtown St. Pete. Beautiful museum. If you've never been there, check it out. But I always imagine if I walk into that museum and there's blue lights shining onto the paintings. Is that gonna show the painting correctly? No. So it sounds insane to do that for a physical piece of art, but why is it okay to watch a movie like that? And that's where I get kind of hung up on the artistic side of things. Now, as far as all the equipment goes and knowing what to measure and what to look for and all that stuff, that's more of a science part of it, but I like to sort of blend the two together. And that's where I think um, the ISF and, and I think for what we do, I think that's where, where it becomes a lot of fun. Now, I've done a number of the TV shootouts with you yes. and some of your predecessors and Joel. Sure. And have seen the BVMs, which have changed through the years. They absolutely you know, have. You know, for a long time, we yep. they didn't support all the really, I mean, they are state of the art now. Right. I think the current one is 4,000 nits capable. Um, so uh, there is a monitor that does 4,000 nits. It's Dolby's monitor. But um, the BVM HX310, um, the 300, the model before that was an RGB OLED. It can only get so bright. But the new one is a dual layer LCD. So it can get really, really, really bright. So we're looking at a thousand nits a monitor on a, with thousand nit content playing on it. And the artist has just a lot more control to make the image look the way they want and it to look. And that's only 32 inches, I think? It's 32 inches. So there's a lot of brightness in a small area. Exactly. And you know, you have to think about in a studio environment, especially, there's very specific things that they do to those rooms to make sure that everything's correct. Um, when you go to a big studio, it's not just one bay 
where there's one of these monitors and they're using something like DaVinci to, to work on the movie, uh, you go to a big studio and there might be 20 bays in there. So if one colorist goes to one bay and the movie looks a certain way, and then the next day that bay is booked, so that colorist goes to another bay, if things don't match up, they don't know what to do with it. So keeping everything looking the same and then us trying to do that in the home is kind of kind of the whole point. But the, the 310 is special because it's, um, it's a thousand nits, full P3 color. Um, now when you say full P3 color, yes. is it legitimately full 3P color? It is. Is it just what we're calling P3 color now? It is. Um, and this was a struggle at first. Um, we did have some shortcomings. Now before we go any further. Yes. Explain P3. Thank you. That's a, that's a good place to start. So um, I've been down this road yeah, and listened to yeah, you. Exactly. Um, so as human beings, we can see a very, um, a very specific uh, bandwidth of energy, and that's what we call light and color. Um, when we talk about TVs and cameras, um, we look at certain color gamuts. Color gamuts are predetermined um, specific shades of color that are used in video systems. So for example, um, when we started off with NTSC color, there was a very specific color gamut called Rec 601, and it was very small. And then in the 90s, we went to Rec 709, which got a little bit bigger. Now we're dealing with Rec 2020, which is huge, but we are running into a limitation right now with the physical capabilities of displays. So we've kind of fallen into a middle ground that's bigger than 709, but smaller than 2020, and that's what's referred to as P3. So um, when we're looking at these monitors, the hope is that they can match the color gamut that the content was mastered in. And that's where it gets difficult. Luckily, we've been able to do it lately, no problem. And I think with the advent of quantum dots and lasers and, and all these different types of light engines, we will be at, P, at uh, 2020, maybe well, in a now, couple of years. You and I, d four weeks ago, three weeks ago, New I, York? I, I, I know, together. it just all blends yeah. together. <laughs> but yeah, something like um, that. This past year, yes. and it was just slightly over a year ago was the last one. Right was a substantial change it was. in picture quality. Mm -hmm. I mean, not just a small evolutionary, this was right. semi-revolutionary to the jump with the QD. Right. Which, huge, and, and I, I tend to be on the cheap side, so. <laughs> hey, nothing wrong with that. I, I could spend it on hi-fi, I'm not. Yeah. But the QD Sony was just an amazing I, television. I, I find myself saying this every few years, uh, maybe every five to 10 years at this point, but I'm like, how much better can it get? And our reference is always gonna go back to that Sony um, reference bar. It's not just Sony, but I, I like to use that as an example because it's the most common. Um, we saw such a jump this year that when we were, um, so the whole idea of the shootout, just in case anybody doesn't know, we take the flagship TVs from all the major manufacturers and we do- Retail versions, not, thank you. not supplied, right. not, specially built, right. tuned. These are model numbers that you can buy anywhere that sells TVs. So, um, and they're not hand-picked. They're straight up, we just grab a box, open it up, and, and let her rip. So, the, the point of the shootout is, we're testing the performance of each one of these displays. And the one of the main goals is to try to match that Sony monitor as close as possible. And it's always been a struggle, because that thing is a reference monitor, it's very expensive, it's a professional monitor, and we're dealing with consumer TVs that are a fifth of the price in a lot of and, and and massive quantity build exactly uh, meanwhile those sony 310s i don't know exactly how many they build but it's nowhere near as many lg oleds as, as they build but um so we're calibrating all the displays we're setting them all to the same standard so when we put them up next to each other they're all in the same playing field and that's the point but part of that is trying to match that 310 monitor as close as possible and it's never really it's we've gotten them very close uh, especially the last year i thought so right right so um, this year I came in, um, a few of the calibrators that were working with me, uh, Dwayne Davis and John Reformato, um, they had already worked on, the, on this TV and it's the Sony, uh, ended up winning, but it's a Sony um, A95K and that is a quantum dot OLED hybrid. Uh, and we can get into that a little bit, uh, how that exa exactly works. But um, when we're trying to match the displays, um, it's a constant back and forth, you know? So we've got a pure white test pattern up on the screen and you have to perceptually match them. So you look at one Because numbers monitor, don't always tell the story. Well, and we can get into this, how much time do you have? But um, we talk about spectral power distribution. And when I measure an OLED, and then I measure an LCD panel, and then I measure a laser-based projector, and then I me measure a three laser, like the UST projectors are right now, they're all gonna look a little bit different from each other. They're, they're slightly different technologies, but they 
They're majorly different technologies, but they look slightly different from each other. So the idea is you calibrate them, and then you have to perceptually match them. So when we're perceptually matching them, we're looking at the reference monitor, and we're going back and forth between the reference monitor and the other TVs. And we're saying, OK, well, that one still has a little green. OK, cool. That one, ooh, that one still has a little blue. Boom. About an hour later, you've got them all tuned into each other. So after this is all done, we start looking at content, making sure everything's there, shadows, good skin tones, all that fun stuff. And I was flabbergasted on how close that Sony Quantum Dot OLED hybrid matched the 310. I mean, I, I sat there. For, I've done this a long time. I've got sharp eyes. And normally, I can tell within a few seconds something's wrong with that monitor. Like, the one here. Yeah, that, and, and thank you for... That we're going to tweak for you after, yeah, after we're yeah, done and here. By the way, it does. It is a <laughs> pathetic example of a television. So... Um, we won't mention any three-letter three, three letter yeah. brands, but it's a pathetic well, example of a TV. Side note, I do want to mention this. Even inexpensive TVs now... Can be better. We can make them tons better. So, going back to the 310, we match them all. They look all the same. Everybody's happy. I'm looking at the other TVs that were in the shootout, and I'm going, okay, well, that one's, you know, that one's pretty close. Oh, okay, this one's, you know, not bad. And the Sony, I was sitting there staring at it for five minutes, probably, and I'm going, oh, my God, like, what? This isn't right. Something's wrong. Something's obviously wrong here. This, this is a ringer. Right. Yeah, because they, Brent, they match so closely that John Reformato, the, one of the other calibrators mm -hmm. working with us, he went to Robert and said, this was a Thursday or a Friday, and he goes, Robert, by the time I get home to Florida, I hope one of these is on my patio. So John bought one right there on the spot. That's how impressed yeah, he was. Yeah, and John's pretty picky. He is. He's picky. He's he's a calibrator, and he's been doing it a long time. And he's got very, very good eyes. So when one of us is that enamored enough with a TV that we order it on the spot, that's that's pretty special. Now, one of the other things I've noticed, because while I'm not an ISF guy, I'm generally yeah. here for a day and a half, two days before the shootout, sure. is watching the time it takes to set up. And we're not going to pick on any brands. No, no, no. But I saw them spend a day and a half on one television yeah. to not get anywhere near what they got with another TV in yep. a couple of hours. Yep, yep. So um, in a lot of cases... Um, and, now, and, I, I oh, do think that got better with that brand. It did. It absolutely did. Um, in a lot of cases, um, you might have a manufacturer who makes a really nice panel. They give it really nice controls. You're going through the menu and you're going, wow, it has this adjustment. Wow, it has that adjustment. Oh, they added this adjustment. They didn't have that last year. And all these little adjustments, you know, one little adjustment here and there is not a huge difference. But when you add up 50 adjustments together, it's, it's a collective thing, right? So when we're looking at some of these TVs, we're going, oh, sweet. They added a new menu to adjust individual colors, for example. But then you go into that menu and you start pushing buttons and the controls don't really work that well or they don't do exactly what you're supposed to do or what they're supposed to do. So it's kind of this constant back and forth of just trying to kind of get everything sort of balanced out. And eventually, if you're patient enough and, and spend enough time on it, you, you get everything dialed in. So some of the manufacturers have really good controls. They are smooth, they're easy to use, they're very granular. Other manufacturers, the controls maybe aren't as smooth. So for example, you're trying to adjust white and the three controls do adjust white are red, green, and blue. And if the, if the white is too blue, you go take out blue, right? But if you go one click down on blue, it might be way too much. Right, so instead of it being a small increment, it's a giant increment. Right, and some of the other manufacturers have it set up in such a way that the uh, adjustments are extremely granular, and that's what we like to see. You know, if I go one click and it makes a tiny difference, good, because that helps me hit some of my targets even better. But if one jumps up way too high or one jumps down way too low, then you gotta kind of figure out, okay, how can I make this control work in our favor? And for the audio guys, that's a 6 dB detent instead of a one and a half db detent Thank you. which is what you want yep good good uh, uh good observation there it's exactly right so anyway end of the day comes along and um the uh the sony ends up winning the shootout and uh, i'm not a judge it's 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 not right for me to be a judge because i'm there to to work the event and i work for a manufacturer who sells gear to all the manufacturers so uh but i i knew in my head after i saw that thing f for you know 10 seconds i said you know what I, I'm not going to say this out loud. I'm going to keep this to myself, but I think that's probably going to be the one. The first year that Sony brought out the Z series. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Stuart and I were at CES. You yeah. know, you wanted the show at the end of the day, sure, sure. you know, at the end of the show, because it's your first chance to get out of the booth. Totally. So Stuart and I walk around, and Sony always has a big, giant booth in the back end of the center hall. Yeah. And they got the Z9 or Z whatever it yeah. was. Z9D was the first You one. know, just sitting out there on the pedestal by itself, and we just walked in. It's like, holy moly. <laughs> it's insane. <laughs> I mean, it's just we just stood there and stared. Yeah, it's easy to. Because, how? What? What? I know. 
How do they do it? And how is this a consumer TV? And how is it the price that it is? And how is it that it, I always make this, uh, this metaphor, if you will, about Tesla. Anybody can just go buy that car. And it's almost not right. You know, it's like, wait a second. I can go zero to 60 in 1.9 seconds and some 16 year old can go buy this car. It's like something's wrong here, but wrong in a good way, right? And that's how, the, that's how that particular panel was. And they continue to make that Z series and it continues to be an awesome TV. Um, I'm a purist, I'm an OLED guy. I went from CRT to plasma to OLED. Um, and, and, and the point of this story is that, I've always said that if I had to buy an LCD TV, that would be the one. And it's, it's the way our eyes are most sensitive to contrast than anything else. Mm -hmm. Contrast is first, then we worry about color, then we worry about resolution. So the big thing about OLED and plasma and CRT was that you had more contrast. Black could well, be this year, dark. Oh, baby, yeah. the contrast. Yeah. So what the LCD panels, like the Z9 and others, you know, but just an example of the technology, um, they, it's a backlight system with an LCD panel in front of it. That's never changed. What the backlight is made of or how it works, that's where things get different. QLED versus, um, Sony calls it their X Master Drive, I think is what they're calling it now, but. X um, Master Drive Extreme now, yeah, I think. Yeah they, yeah, they keep adding pluses and turbos and extremes to them, but. Um, kind of a top gear kind of thing. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So um, what makes those TVs so special, and this is really true for any, um, we call it FALD, F-A-L-D, Full Array Local Dimming. So imagine you have an LCD panel and behind it, you've got a giant amount of little tiny LEDs. Mm -hmm. That's little flashlights. Right, tiny little LED flashlights. Well, not every pixel has its own flashlight. So when the image is supposed to go dark, it doesn't quite go pure black like an OLED does. But here's the kicker. If they can make those LEDs smaller and smaller and smaller and be able to control them better, you can put something on the screen with a black background and the black is actually pretty black. So that specific TV and the Z9s and, and, and the rest of them, um, there was even a mini LED this year uh, from Samsung that did pretty well. Um, Black can be pretty black for the most part. And the blooming issues that we had with previous versions of LCD, those, those are starting to go away. So when you see a TV like that, if for somebody who might not know exactly what they're looking for, you could probably tell somebody that's an OLED and they would believe you because the local dimming is, is so well controlled and, and so good on those TVs. Oh, well, I remember when we switched from edge lighting Oh man! To backlighting, yeah, eight that zones. Was a big deal. Eight yeah, zones right. of backlight. Yeah. Hey, wow! Uh huh. And then you see sixteen. It's like, oh my God, look yeah, at that! Exactly, exactly. And you know, I, I remember too. Just a little side note here. Um, when Pioneer, when that whole thing happened with their plasmas and stopped making them, they had. Some, you mean that day of cry, of crying and they, that day and the day Op Oppo stopped. I, those are two, you know, balled up in the corner in the fetal position crying days. But um, a few of the Pioneer folks went to Sharp. And they made a Sharp Elite. They made it for two years. They had a 50 and a 60 inch. Very high and very expensive like the Pioneer Plasmas were. That TV had 535 or 550 local dim dimming zones and we were freaking out. You know, and nowadays, some TVs have less zones, less zones but way more control, which sort of balances mm -hmm. the amount of zones out. Not that big of a deal. But the really big advantage of what you saw, and I think this has a lot to do with it, as far as brightness goes, because it is an LCD panel with LEDs and not an OLED, they can skyrocket up in luminance. So when you have that combination of really good black and really high luminance, guess what? It's great for living in the everyday world. It's dynamics, right? It's the same mm -hmm. as audio. So that dynamic range is what our eyes and our brains like the most, and the more the better. So when you have these really high luminance LCD panels, whether they're LED backlit or quantum dot backlit or some sort of hybrid, we're getting that brightness but with the good control of the local zones, or if it's an OLED and black actually is black, that gives us a really low black level. Well, now, Boom, lots of dynamic range. Uh, how did we get the dynamic range in the QD of LEDs that we did not have in the previous good OLEDs? Because you know, it's one of the things, having done this again for a number of years with the yep. shootout, is the OLEDs, the black levels are just incredible. Right. But when you look down the four TVs down and you saw that Z series Wait a second. and you saw say <laughs> yeah. in a, f a football scene or an yeah. outdoor scene it's like yeah okay that's pretty right. that's pretty but but <laughs> wow yeah yeah no. so this it, year the dynamic range to me was the big change it was it really was and just in a nutshell the way those TVs work they still have a blue OLED layer so that's what gets the electricity and lights things up but there's a quantum dot layer on top of that. It's a super, super, super thin piece of film, and it's embedded with quantum dots. 
What's really cool about quantum dots, the size of the molecules determine what color they are. It's really cool, almost sci-fi type stuff. So when that blue OLED layer passes through the quantum dot layer, the blue is converted into red and green. So now you have the actual pixels that are lighting up and giving us a picture are red, green, and blue. And because of that quantum dot layer and because of the new technology they're doing with the heat sink and stuff on the OLED layer, we're able to get easily a thousand nits out of these hybrids. Which is incredible because we couldn't before. We were topping out at you know, six, 700 nits with a traditional WRGB OLED up until now. So this was the first time in any of our lives that we saw unlimited dynamic range because of perfect black and a thousand nits all at the same time with a super wide P3 color gamut. So this is one of the reasons why we're all sitting there going, holy crap, like this is, this is insane. So it was, like you said, it was a big jump. Uh, we also had some really big changes with the 8K OLEDs. Mm -hmm. uh, they got the new heat sink as well, which was really cool. Um, and, just, yeah, and you know, it's the LG one. The LG 8K one, the 8K One, day. but yep. the price difference between that and oh, the dude. other two. It, it's, it's crazy. And they were, they were not, identical in picture quality right but for the price difference they were really really close when you start talking two and a half times the price and not, i mean now you're into twenty five thousand dollar television mm -hmm. i love our early adopters we need them thank you <laughs> right we do we do but when you consider that kind of price difference man i mean if you can if you can spend half the money and get almost as good i'm all about that you know you know i've had this conversations before i'm all about bang for your buck mm -hmm. and i love the idea of building we'll call it a budget system, <laughs> but putting it in a good room and tuning it, calibrating it, the audio and the video, man, I've seen I've seen budget rooms destroy high-end rooms because of the room in the setup. Well, when you can get 85 inches of 8K, yeah, and you know, we now have 8K sources, as we were yeah. talking about the computer earlier and the, sure. the Series X, yeah, Xbox. Right. So the ability to get this content, mm -hmm. and suddenly, you know that, that 85 inch at 8K yeah. is a whole lot more impressive than 100 inches at 1080 or maybe even 4K. Yeah. This is a whole can of worms, and I know people are probably listening and going, oh, 8K doesn't matter, we can't see it, blah, blah, blah. I heard the same thing about 4K. But 1080p for these old guys. Well, we, uh, the broadcast guys were hearing, oh, we don't need Rec. 709 color. You know, it's, it's, it's continuous. It's every few years we hear this, and I get it, right? Like, the consumers have been burned before. They've been burned with curved mm. screens, 3D. They've been burned with 3D, which were all cool technologies, but you had to do it just right, and nobody did. So that's what happened. Um, HD DVD. First, first version <laughs> of 4K or 4K. Yeah, right, exactly. So, and I get it. You know, as a consumer, you're going, man, I bought this technology three years ago, and it's already obsolete. Like, this sucks. I'm not going to buy the next thing. Okay, not for nothing. I'm old enough to have gone through albums. Oh, yeah. 45s. Yeah. Eight tracks. Yep. Cassettes. Oh, yeah. CDs, yep. CDs, uh, mobile <laughs> fidelity CDs, gold CDs, DVD audio, SACD, yeah. um, high definition streaming. Yeah. So, oh, mm -hmm. we've gone to sleep. sleep um, yeah, but screensaver you, mode. Yeah, screensaver mode. Thank well, you. And uh, how about 1080i VHS? Uh, first off, that was the WVHS <laughs> yeah. by JVC. Yes. And Sony and Zenith had one. I did those as well. And we yeah. were just, look at this. Of course, I remember S video. Yep, same. Yeah, yeah. And as a side note, all the complaints that we have about HDMI distance and capabilities. Right. Oh, it didn't. We didn't have those problems with the component. Yeah, you did. Yeah. Yeah, you it's did. It's still a cable. You know, you know this still... S video was meant to go six feet. Right. Component in the early days was a replacement for VGA, meant to go six to 12 feet. Right, right. We made it work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it wasn't meant to. Right. HDMI, now we're up to 300 feet for 8K. Yeah. So, it's, it, it's now always, there's a lot more going on with that. Yeah, um, you mentioned the content, and that's always really what I feel like it always comes back to. You have these super high-res TVs, but no content. We heard the same thing with 4K, right? There was no content, there's no content, what's the point? Now you go into a retail store, even though that disc sales are way down, as we all know, there's, there's no secrets there, but even going into a retail store now, they've got rows and rows and rows of 4K discs. Okay, cool. Um, I, I follow the numbers, and 4K discs, have jumped up uh, since COVID, like 25% in sales. Oh, good. Because I think a lot of people are looking at their old 1080p TV and going, oh man, it's time to get a new one. So they're getting 4K content, whether it's streaming or discs, either way. So yes, we don't have a lot of 8K content right now, but it's coming. We've already well, seen it. Okay, when 4K first hit, your options were channel 101 and 102 on DirecTV. Yeah, I remember, yeah. yeah. Which was nature programming. Yep. Well, you mentioned the 1080i w WVHS. Yeah. 
The only thing I ever saw in that was a coronation ceremony for the queen. Oh, yeah, that's funny. Over yeah. and over yeah. and over. Yeah. And then in the early days of component high definition, Mitsubishi had semi-tractor trailers that went around the U.S. Mm -hmm. And it was soccer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Do you remember the 1080i, the WVHS? Uh, the one that I saw all the time was like uh, somebody was basically walking through New York and they had 1080i VHS at the time and it was it was. I awesome. don't remember that one. So the one that sticks out for me is because I saw it day after day yeah. after day was the coronation. It's kind of like the uh, it's kind of like the uh, Hotel California of yes. video demos. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> exactly. So, no, no. But the, the video, did the, for us, back in the 80s, yeah. in the early days, we know it was three, 385, 365 VHS, yep. was not Top Gun, mm -hmm. it was Rustler's Rhapsody. I don't know that. Oh, it was a Tom Berenger movie when yeah. he was very young, and it starts off with a small black and white screen, Okay. talking about 30s cowboy star Rex O'Hurlihan. Okay. And the sounds all, you know, center channel, sure. horrible. And the narrator says, you know, I kind of wonder what it would be like if we made them today. Oh. It goes from this little center channel only, yeah. cheesy sound, black and white speaker, to full 16.9 color with surround sound. Mm -hmm. Now, Rex O'Hurlihan, big white hat, yeah. chasing the bad guys, three yeah. bad guys, one Rex, firing his pistols with his reins in his teeth. Everybody stops when the ground shakes and the color comes on. They're yes, all looking around like, what the hell? Wait a second. And they turn around and they realize there's three of them, Yeah. one a Rex. Right. Right. So they start shooting back, and you're hearing the bullets go over your shoulders. Now, this is Dolby ProLogic in the early days, so it's mono rears. Sure, sure. But for the first time ever, you're actually hearing. Yeah. You're like, this and is not real. What's happening This here? was our Dat and Top People Gun. People are ducking like, yeah. in their seats, which, hey, we still do now with Atmos, right? It's like all, all happening again. But So it's, yeah. it's, it's certainly in the early days, it was nothing. Right. There's always nothing. There has to be a start. Well, and here's the funny part. And um, I can tell you, based on what Stuart has downloaded from the internet, oh yeah, there's not a there's not just a small amount of AK. There's right. a decent it's amount of there. content. Um, we talked to a lot of cinematographers, and a lot of these guys have been shooting 8K for five plus years, and then they're just cropping it down. Right. The footage is out there, and and eventually the content will be will be a lot to choose from. But uh, just I, I do want to touch on one thing for for the folks out there who might be wondering, like, what's the point of 8K? Like, you can't see it. Blah blah. blah. Um, I disavow that statement. I, I do. And and number one. Um, in an 8K TV, you're going to get the best processing because it kind of has to be. So you're getting all the good guts with an 8K panel, which is cool. Now, what does that give you? Tremendous quality upscaling. We can put 1080, and we did this at the shootout. We put in 1080 content on the 8K TVs, and we were going, that's only 1080p? The processing is so good. And Robert points this out a lot, and I 100% agree with him. When, the first time he said this, I was like, yeah, I, I, that's what I've been saying. When you have a round object on the screen and you have more pixels to work with, the round object is round. When you look at... Um, let's say a 1080p that's upscaled to say 4K, you still have a lot of pixels, but not as much as 8K, right? So when you look at a round object on the screen, it kind of has this, if you look real close, kind of has this stair step thing mm -hmm. going. It's digital, right? So that has pretty much gone away with 8K. So you can sit a lot closer. You can go a lot bigger in screen size. I mean, we are dealing with 80 plus inch 8K TVs. Yeah, 85, 86. I'm this close to them and I, I can't pick out pixels. I mean, it's, it's really unbelievable stuff. So the content's coming. The upscaling is phenomenal. Yes, it's still pricey, but 4K was pricey. So was 1080p. And well, so now, now I can tell you, you can buy a, um, a TCL. Yeah. Pick on them a little bit, but you can buy a TCL for $398 at Walmart. Yeah. 4K HDR and it's, you know, is it the best TV on the market? No, but compared to what you bought four years oh. ago that was 4K, yeah. it's as good or better than, I can promise you what we first started doing at 4K yeah. at the shootout mm -hmm. is now surpassed at $400. I, I've always said that, and you're exactly right. Um, what we're seeing picture quality-wise now for inexpensive TVs destroys what we've seen in the past. And I, I, if I could go back in time and put one of these, let's say, five to $700 TVs next to a $5,000 TV seven years ago, You'd be like, oh, that's obviously the more expensive, newest one, and well, now it's it's it, the the leaps in the past two years and the cost coming down is why we are the place we are. And I get calls all the time from friends and family, just like you do too. Hey, mom's TV broke. What should she get? Or hey, my TV yep. broke. What should I get? And a lot of times I say, okay, well, you know, what's your budget? I, I'd like for you to go get the OLED, but I get it. If, if you if you can't swing it or don't want to swing it, I get it. And there's five or six TVs that I can tell them. Go check out this TV. It's 600 bucks, 700 bucks, whatever. 
It's 65 inches, which is now like normal. <laughs> um, and, and, they're, and, and they're just fantastic performance for the price. The average person keeps a TV for five to seven years. Most normal human beings, not us, but most normal human beings. I keep mine longer. Yeah, so, okay, well then not you. So, um, <laughs> when, when you start thinking about a TV that somebody was looking at for five years that they bought, you know, that, all that time ago. Right, and it probably wasn't an expensive one then because they bought the tail end of that technology, right. let's be honest. Right, exactly. And when, when you skip five years in TV technology, it is mind-blowingly better. I, I used to buy cell phones every year, and I got tired of it. I was like, this is stupid. I can wait three generations of cell phones, but if you wait three generations on TVs, it is such a massive improvement. You, the technology just keeps getting better. The manufacturers are getting smarter. The content's getting better. The delivery system is getting better. Oh, look where it's, we are with Netflix and Amazon oh my gosh. compared to where we were four years ago. Yep. When Grand Tour hit Amazon, and yes. for the first time you could see real created as 4K HDR content. Right. Streaming, and mm -hmm. we're not talking disc, we're talking streaming videos, right. like. Wait a second. Wow. Yeah, exactly. Now, the very first shootout I did, we're down in the basement at the, in New York. Yeah. The one downstairs. And Robert brought out his Pioneer Plasma. The one that had been ISF to within an inch of its life. That's the Oversized one. power supply. I mean, he yeah. put a lot into this TV. Mm -hmm. And the reality of that was, when you're comparing non-4K, non-HDR content, that set still hung. Yeah. With all the other TVs. It's yeah. like, okay, it's not 65. They all are. But you know what? Yeah. But as soon as we hit 4K HDR, it's over. the world changed. Yeah. It's like, yeah. okay, yep, roll it away. When, when we look at, and I still have private clients who I calibrate for who still hold on to those pioneers, and I don't blame them. I, I would hold on the to them. The blacks are awesome. The blacks are awesome. They're not black. And that's the big misconception. You put it next to an OLED and you go, oh, okay, I get it now, right? But, but until you do, you have to see it. Compared to LCDs that came out after them, yeah. why would you get rid of the pioneer? Right. I get right. it. Because right. the LCDs were terrible. Mm -hmm. and, and, and trust me, the pioneers, if you're watching regular 1080p Blu ray, they're still phenomenal TVs. But at $7,000 in 2009, that was last a year they made them. a lot of money. But now you can go buy a really nice OLED at 65 inches for less than two grand. We're talking seven grand to two grand. And an insane jump in picture quality. It's, it's, it's cool. And I feel like it's, there's something about TV manufacturing to where I feel like, and maybe this is just because the world I live in, it gets so much better and so much cheaper year after year after year. And it's going to get to a point one day where we're going to have such good pictures on inexpensive large TVs. Now we're going to be thinking like, what's next, right? But okay, no, not for nothing. No, go ahead. We've been having that exact same question for the last ten Forever. years. Yeah, right. Of of you know the shootouts. It's like, right. well, what's next? Where do we go? How can right. it get better? So the uh, you know as well as anybody, but just in case, uh, the HDMI 2.1 spec goes all the way to 10K. It goes all the way to 10,000 nits. It goes all the way to 120 frames per second, and it goes all the way to the big giant Rec 2020 color gamut. That stuff is all baked into the spec. Um, I really applaud HDMI for building a spec that's meant to last many, many, many years because it's kind of new. They had not really done that before and thought that far ahead before, but they did this time. So we're having these conversations about what's next, how could it possibly be better. We haven't even seen, and, and we can't even really imagine what could be better because it doesn't exist yet. The, there's there's only a handful of movies um, that have that super wide color gamut. And it's funny because in content creation, it's like, how can we make a movie at 10,000 nits with Rec 2020 color if we don't have a display that can show it? Well, the math is solid. We know the math is solid. So when you convert like in a display, if you're showing um, 2020 content on a P3 capable display, the math is solid. We can squish that color gamut down. It's gonna fit, it's all good. But what's gonna be interesting, and I know you will feel me on this one, once we have displays that can do this, just like with audio, you get a new set of headphones, what do you do? You go re-listen to everything, everything you've ever done, yep. So we're gonna do the same thing with video all over again. So and I'm and we've, for we've it. done it every time. Every I mean, time. that's just, you know, you go and you buy a new pair of speakers, or you buy a new, for us old guys, a new cartridge. Yeah, right. The album that you've listened to a hundred times before. Sounds different. You're gonna put it on there, it's like, I, I never, I, I never, never heard, heard that, that before. <laughs> yes, trust me. I, yeah, that's 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 cool. But it'll be the same thing with video, and because that spec is written out to be just insane ceilings with all these. No, let's talk parameters. about some of those yeah. specs for a second. Sure. Um, 
A lot of people don't understand HDR. That's not a bandwidth spec, that's a metadata spec. So right. all the work's done in the panel. Right. So if I have content, I have a movie mm -hmm. streaming in that say, we pick 10,000 nits. Right. It's capable of 10,000 nits on the content. And you mean the content, absolutely. Yes, the okay. content. Now you're, you got, say a TV at 1,000, and another TV at 420, mm -hmm. a non-HDR TV. Right. And then maybe you've got a TV that's five grand. I don't know of any that yeah. are yet, but let's yeah. assume it's out there. Right. The TV is actually doing all the lifting on this, not the content, correct? Well, kind of, um, and you're definitely on the right path. And just to give everybody a frame of reference, when we're saying these different nit values and nit levels, um, that's the overall luminance of a display. Um, when we're talking about standard dynamic range, what we've been watching our whole, most of us have been watching our whole lives, um, that stuff is mastered at 100 nits. It's meant for a dark room on a CRT TV. And when we went from CRT to LCD to DLP and all these other technologies, that never changed. Right, because so, the technology really didn't have the dynamic capability right. or the carriage system. Exactly, exactly. So when we're talking about content right now, um, what we commonly refer to are really the big three, 1,000 nits, 4,000 nits, 10,000 nits. So a lot of people are like, oh my God, 10,000 nits, that's going to blind somebody. The whole picture isn't 10,000 nits. When you see a firework explode on the screen, there might be 10,000 nits worth of content in the middle of that firework for 10 frames, if, if that. Well, and that's the thing, because dynamic HDR changes what we know from traditional HDR yes, as well. It does. It does. So now instead of full panel, full movie, right? now you can get very specific, not just individual scenes, but the ability to break it going forward, mm -hmm. maybe not today, but in the not overly distant future, yep. to break down, okay, it's going to be this group of pixels. Right. And, that's and it, not th the whole panel. That's what the content creators are doing right now. So if you take a technology like HDR10 Plus or Dolby Vision, you, you mentioned before dynamic metadata, um, there's information along with the signal that says, okay, at this timestamp, I want these pixels to be this bright and this color for this many frames. And what's cool about that from an art, artistic or content creation standpoint, if, if I'm color grading a movie and I'm sitting there with the DP and, and the cinematographers, we can say, okay, let's make this scene really, really, really dark, except for this one neon light and it just absolutely pops out at you. Well, guess what? That's how we see stuff in real life. So that's really the big difference between standard dynamic range and high dynamic range is we have just so much more of a container to fit the content in. So in HDR 10 plus and Dolby Vision, these guys can go through, not necessarily scene by scene, they can go frame by frame and they can literally adjust that movie every frame, however they want to do it. And that's what's really cool. It's like giving the artist, you know, uh, a giant box of crayons versus a small box of crayons. The more the more control they have over it, the more creative they can get, and the cooler. Now the this is done after the fact, frame by frame, yes. versus live broadcast HLG. Yes, um, HLG is going to be a game changer, and uh, you, you'll remember this, and probably most people watching that lived through the um, standard F to HD transition. Um, I'm from Lakeland. I grew up uh, not too far from here, and when you got the best of both worlds, because you got Tampa channels. And Orlando yeah, channels. Exactly, yeah. We good, only got Orlando yeah, channels. Good call, good call. Um, so you would have like, um, let's say HDNet, Mark Cuban's channel. It was specific. There was only HD version. There was no standard F version of that channel. But then other channels had two channels. Right. One for HD, one for SD. And it was like, if you were watching the wrong channel, you weren't getting in, in the full quality. And I would always, you know, I'd go to my mom's house to visit her. And big like, mom, why are you watching channel 28? You need to be watching 1128, right? So it was always this really confusing thing for most end users. The great thing about HLG, it is a high dynamic range format, but it's over broadcast. Here's the great part about it. It is completely backwards compatible with even going back to granny's 19 inch CRT TV. So if we're watching the Super Bowl in HLG, you and I are gonna get it on our TVs in HDR, but grandma's still gonna get it on her 19 inch TV without having to think about doing another channel. Right, because nothing's changed. It's just additional metadata. It's and if it's it not is, recognized, it it's ignored. It just ignores the metadata. So yeah, that, that's exactly right. And um, we're going to see it soon. Um, I, there was a little bit of a hang up over the last two years. Uh, but um, I'll just give you an example. Uh, two or three Super Bowls ago, Chiefs, and I'm not a big sports guy, but um, if you had a Roku and a very specific app, and I forget which one it is right now, but you could watch the Super Bowl in HDR. And it was incredible. Now there was some golfing. There was some golf in HDR as well. And I don't remember the specifics, but there oh. was some golf, some golf in HDR. Oh, it was the Masters, and it was only on Direct TV. It was an HLG. Yep, yep. I, I do remember that now. But seeing the uh, the team colors and the grass, and even seeing the advertisements on the screen, 
you're like, holy moly, like I've never seen football like this before. Yeah, now having sold Sony most of my life, yeah, yeah. when you saw a Sony in a store, yeah. On sports, which everybody showed yep, when yep. football season when our best baseball was around, they tended toward a green picture to make that grass. Oh, for sure. It's I mean, it's like, wow, look yeah. at that grass. Yeah. Meanwhile, the rest of the color was, eh, but the grass looked great. How do I know that that is green? I've got two sets of tools. One right here and one right here. So, and let's talk about that because yeah. as you joked about the quality of my... <laughs> Now, at least what you guys don't see is we have a 49 inch, 43 yeah. inch, I don't know, Hitachi TCL TV in yeah. front of us. Super blue, way overly sharpened. Yeah, overly bright. Yeah. Contrast is pathetic. We'll fix it after we're done. But <laughs> also, when, you, when you're standing here, yeah. looking into those LED lights that they don't see to brighten us up, sure. we're looking into something not near as bright. So right. we have to crank it up and exactly. it looks pathetic. It, it does. You, He's right. You you have to you have to adjust for the environment. And right? you do, and this environment is, is sucky. So if you were going to make that TV look good mm -hmm. in this environment, do you have the tools to make not great, just better. 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 Absolutely. Um, so there's a few tools that we use. Um, the most important thing for most people to wrap their head around is getting it out of the factory picture mode. And I don't know what mode that's in, we'll we'll investigate that later. <laughs> But <laughs> the crap mode. It, it, it it's really funny. When I started, we were dealing with plasmas and and uh, CCFL LCDs, like fluorescent tube mm -hmm. based LCDs, and then we got into edge lit a little bit. And it was always about. I haven't even thought of CFL TVs. Yeah, and it's been a while. Yeah, the really deep Sony's. Super thick, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, one of the most sexiest ones to me was the XBR3. It had a glass bezel. Oh, yeah, I, so I had one. Beautiful TV. Beautiful. Heavy. Oh, man, TV. was it heavy. It's a yeah. 50, 50 or 55 inch it TV. The speakers people. floated in the glass. It was really pretty. It was sexy turned off, is what I used to mm -hmm. say about it. Um, so um, we, we see all these transitions going on. And in the early days, um, and this was also a tube thing as well, and DLP and, and all the others, but um, you would unbox your TV, you'd set it up, you would turn it on and it would be in the brightest picture mode possible. Retail mode. Vivid mode, dynamic mode, and that's what we see in the retail stores today. And what we had to do back then was we had to detune them to calibrate them. Oh, it's way too bright, the contrast is way too high, the whites are clipped, the blacks are way too low to look more dynamic, but we can't see shadows, color saturation's cranked up to make colors more colorful, but skin tones look really weird, all this weird stuff was going on. So when we would detune, say, a plasma, you would look at it and you would say, you know, it does look better, the fidelity is better, but man, it's a lot dimmer. Or flat. And it was a bummer, right? Mm -hmm. But you're dealing with a plasma in Florida in someone's living room, and it was all we could do. There was no backlight, there was, no, there was nothing you could do, it just is what it is. How do you fix that? Make the room darker. You can't always do that, right? So It's Florida, people have got sliding glass windows. Well, people pay millions of dollars for these views, and I, I totally get it, but what we're seeing today is the You exact have different friends than I do, <laughs> just to let you know. Hey. These are just people that hire me. <laughs> um, we're seeing the opposite now. So everybody's all about Energy Star and conserving power and all this other stuff. And it comes from CRTs and plasmas that you would use a ton of energy. I mean, you remember how hot they would get. Oh yeah, you could heat your room with the, with the Pioneer Elite. So I had for a long time a Panasonic 65 inch plasma and um, my two channel tube preamp and amp and the room would get hot. You're, you're, oh, yeah, that, plas exactly well, right. that plasma was, whew. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's a, you know, California outlawed plasma, so did Australia long before energy. anybody else right. because of energy compliance. Right. And that's the whole point of the Energy Star stuff now. So when you go into a store now, you get that yellow sticker along the side that says this TV is $14 a year to use. Okay, cool. Not that bad. Plasma would say 120 So big improvements. But how do they get away with that? The TVs now, out of the box, have an Energy Star mode or energy savings mode. And they're really dim, and they're really, they do other things to make it not look so dim. They'll blow the color saturation up, they'll crank the grayscale so it's very blue. We'll get into why they do that a little bit here later, but um, it's a lot dimmer. So then somebody like me comes in, and we turn off the Energy Star. We turn off the horrible motion processing. Yeah. We turn off the ambient light sensors. So now we're getting a more accurate picture and it's brighter and more dynamic, whereas before it'd be really bright and we would detune it down. So we're living in a little bit different world now where I'll go calibrate for somebody and the difference is so huge, especially if they were in the factory picture mode, they go, holy crap. So this whole idea of, oh, it's not as bright as it used to be after it was calibrated, that stuff has been out the window now for a few years. Okay, now on that note, yeah. 
and we used to see this in audio all the time. You go in, you set the room up, you get the speakers properly placed, you mm -hmm. do some things to try to get it as flat as possible. Sure. You walk out the door, they hit the loudness button. Yeah, exactly, absolutely. Because what sounded right was it, not what sounded sound good. good. I, yep, I, I totally get that. And I've heard, certainly in the early days in particular, there's a lot of ISF guys who were very frustrated because yeah. they would spend not a small amount of time, and I think it was $400 back then. Yeah. Three, four, you, you know, to get the job there. done, they walk right. out the door, they go to check on the customer a month or two or four later, and they back, they the back in vivid mode. Yeah, yeah, and you know, I get that, right? We're 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 attracted to bright things. That's just how our eyes and how our brains work. Um, the really the key in that is for for me and for what we teach in the ISF courses is teaching people what to look for. So when I get done calibrating a TV or a projector for somebody, I spend some time with the end user and I say, okay. We're going to look at these charts and these graphs. They're kind of geeky. There's some numbers here. You kind of can get some very basic conceptual ideas about color accuracy, right? But what does it actually look like? So what I like to do is I put in a, a really good piece of demo content, just like you would do with audio, right? Mm -hmm. You find a really good track, something you know really well, and you can speak to it. So when we're watching the now calibrated projector or TV, I'm going, okay, look. Look how natural the skin tones look. What do you think? Oh, yeah, they look pretty good. Check out the grass in the background. Looks, you know, looks like real grass, right? Oh yeah, it does look pretty good. Look in the bottom corner here by this guy's leg. Can you see the shadows? Oh yeah, I can see the shadows. Uh, look at this cloud up in the sky. Can you see detail? Oh yeah, cool. Let's go back to what you were watching. And all of a sudden you hit vivid mode or energy savings mode and it, whoa, what happened to all that stuff we just pointed out? So when we have the whole conversation of it looking a lot different, it does. And it is correct. That's what the movie was mastered to. It's still a really good idea to figure out what you're actually looking for. And the thing that I usually go by most when I talk about color accuracy is skin tones. We all know skin tones. And if you have some really good looking content, maybe it's a movie, maybe it's a test pattern, whatever, with good skin tones, that's the dead giveaway. You go from good skin tones to people who look like they're sunburned or the whole entire image gets dark and their skin tones also look really crappy. That's really the, that's really where the now, magic happens for me. What, on that note, what are you using for content? And do we have any questions so far on the, uh, no, All right. perfect. Cool. He hasn't given us a break to ask any. Sorry. That's, <laughs> that's okay. This is perfect. Yeah, so, you yeah. know, we certainly use a wide variety of content totally. here. The totally. classic for testing purposes being Billy Lynn's long halftime walk, yeah. which is good for testing 4k 60, but, Color, I mean, just it's a horrible bad movie. Other than the 120, yeah, it's terrible. Well, it's funny because the movie was done at 120, but there were like 14 theaters in the country that could actually show it. And 120, as you know, is not part of HDMI 2.0, no. so they had to knock it down to 60. So even watching it at 60, we're still not seeing it right. the correct way. But that's a, that's a good point. And by the way, I would suggest retiring that disc and getting Gemini Man. Same okay. director, 60 frames per second, Bill okay. Smith. It's a lot more interesting movie. Um, well, and there's much better darks and lights because looking at the desert scenes, as soon as you get off the sand on Billy Lynn's yeah. Long Halftime, the color crush is yeah. horrible. It does. And a lot of the scenes in Gemini Man are just really beautiful, uh, really colorful buildings, good skin tones. One of my favorite scenes to show in that movie, it's a nighttime scene. There's a, a boat out on the water and the moon is glistening off the water. And that's where you're getting those bright pops What was the tiger HDR? one we all used in the early days of the... Probably Life of Pi. Yeah. yeah. Which also did not have that good a video Guess on what? It. Billy Lynn, Gemini Man, Life of Pi. All Ang Lee? All the same, act all the same director. All Ang Lee? All Ang Lee, yeah, exactly. So he's known for doing like out of the box, you know, off the wall kind of stuff. And, um, but yeah, I, I would take a look at Gemini Man if anybody out there wants to pick up that disc or I don't know if it's streaming, it might be, but. Um, you want the disc so you know exactly what you're getting. Thank you. And you know, you're putting, the problem with streaming too, as good as it is, you're also relying on your internet connection mm -hmm. and a few other things. But the disc is always going to be like. Your of course, reference. and if you don't have a Blu-ray HDR player, get yourself a a good uh, box that does USB, like the yeah. Shield. Yeah. Put it on a USB yeah. stick and um, have it with you. I do this a lot. I didn't bring my book of discs with me, but um, you would appreciate this. I've seen this. your book of discs. It's it's got an MB quart. And, and, uh, car stereo and from, the, the, yeah, yeah. from the old days of car stereo. That was, they would come to Sound Advice where I worked at the time and give away swag. And I still have that book to this day. I, I'm never going to get rid of it, but it's full of a bunch of different things. I change the discs out every once in a while, but I do have a few that stay in there. Um, and then also in that book, uh, kind of in the, uh, in between the, the, the cover and the, where the discs actually start, um, I've got a couple USB sticks. 
and they've got some still images or maybe just some short mm -hmm. clips of something I know. Now what we're doing in the field when we're calibrating, we've got something like this little signal generator right here. Ours is right over there against the wall. There you go, against the wall. And then we've also got something like this. Uh, this now, is, this, this is the, the big boy. The 7? This is the 7G. And the, the, what I want to point out about this, I have some technical test patterns that I can look at, like the Simpty color bars, which most of us have seen at some point in our life. But I also have some reference images as well. So when I'm calibrating, I'm tuning color. I'm going back to the skin tones that I know. I tune more color. I go back to the skin tones that I know. So, you know, it's always going to, you always have to have some sort of reference, right? It's just like audio, man. It just, it, it all works so much in the same way. It's, it's, it's pretty cool. But, um, yes. Oh, there's a question. Sweet. Uh, what is it? Okay. Uh, how long is the ISF training process? Ah, good call. Um, so the, the question was, how long is the class to learn you. to be an ISF? Um, the class is three days. The journey lasts forever. And I know that sounds silly and cliche, but I got into it because when I was about 19 or 20, I was working at Sound Advice, and one of my coworkers showed me a, um, a disc called Avia Guide to Home Theater. I've seen that disc. And I still have it to this day. And we would go into the little dark, at the time we had dark showrooms, and we would get under a blanket, and we would set the levels on the TV based on the disc. That's where I really started getting into this. There's a, more of a history to it, but that's really where it got out of control. Um, and you know, it's funny because I asked Dwayne this same question, yeah. and I've got an hour-long interview that we have to finish up in Trent yeah. to get up online, but yeah. it's the same Similar, same right? story. It's like, you know, I started doing this because I thought my TV just didn't yeah. look good. Well, and I've always been into modifying stuff. You know, my first car I ever got, the first thing I did was put a K&N filter in it, and, you know, that, that whole journey with cars spiraled out of control, too. But that's where you start, right? You want to make it better. And how do you make it better? You need the tools. So um, the class is three days. Um, I went to my first class in 2007, but I'd already been way interested in what, in, in what it was all about. Um, I was having a conversation with a new calibrator this morning, actually, on my way here. And I told him, I said, look, I learn something new every day. And it's not just a, a specific new panel with a new setting. It's, it's researching and finding new content. It's finding new, um, like when Dwayne and I hang out, I'm like, mm -hmm. how do you do this? He goes, oh, here's how I do it. How do you do it? And I'm like, oh, here's how I do it. I'm like, oh, I never thought about doing it like that. Same thing with John. It is, yeah, it is a constant learning curve. Um, and a lot of people think like, oh, I go to the class, I learn how to calibrate TVs, and then- I'm now an ISF calibrator. I'm now a, you know, and, and that's cool. And uh, the same guy I was talking to this morning, he went to a, a class in New York, the one right before the shootout that you and I were at. And he's like, this might sound crazy, but when my kids go to sleep, I go down to my basement and I practice for three or four hours a night, three, four nights a week. And I'm like, dude, that's great. Guess what that's I did? That's what you should be doing. Guess what I did when I learned how to play guitar? I didn't take one lesson and say, oh, I'm a master at it now. You've got to practice, right? So it's a three-day course, but it's a, a, a lifelong journey, if you will, to not only keep up with new technologies, but I, I keep notes on my phone. I think I've showed you before. This mm -hmm. is silly, but um, when I'm watching a movie I've never seen before, a TV show I've ne never seen before, I take notes on my phone. Chapter three, 31 minutes and 14 seconds in, really good shadow detail in the lower left corner of the screen. When the See, guy mine was for under audio. The, right, it's track seven, yep. halfway through, uh, listen there, to there, the bass guitar. Or there's gonna be a pop here. Right, exactly. It, there's a little digital clipping here. It's, it's all so similar. I mean, sound goes in here, light goes in here, it's all waves, right? So a lot of these concepts just totally apply to each other. But um, I'm constantly taking notes, I'm constantly watching new content. When I, when I teach the course, one of my first questions to everybody is, you know, what's your name, where are you from, tell me about your experience, and what's your favorite demo movie? Because that's honestly a little selfishly for me, because I want to know what's out there. I want to know what looks good. I do like a specific type of movie typically, but there's certain movies like I don't really like musicals, but somebody will say, hey, I know you don't like musicals, but you got to get this disc. It looks amazing. Check this scene out. So yeah, it's, 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 a, it's kind of a combination of a job and a hobby at the same time, which well, I think is Obviously, really cool. you yeah. and I are in the same boat there. Right, right. Because so, my goal is to make it to 75 doing this. Yeah, it, hey. And it's not as far away as it is for you. No. But, <laughs> no. Uh, but no, to, to answer the question at the end of the day, it's a three-day course. Um, I do as much prep work as I can with people on the way in. Um, I like to send them videos to kind of get ready for what they're about to which they should. go through for the next three days because it's not, um, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot of information. Um, I wish it was four days, but we only have so much time. Um, but uh, one of the things I do too with the calibrators is I offer my time to them after the fact. So somebody goes to class, um, this happened today, same guy actually, 
And he's like, you know, we covered this one part, but I still don't quite get it. So, okay, cool. Let's take 15, 20 minutes and just make sure you really understand it. Well, um, now, along with this, you also do tech support for one of our competitors. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> well, no, 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 because you, they're, they're, it's funny because there, there's not a lot of people you can actually discuss yeah. about what we do with. That's true. Yeah, yeah. And it's the same thing in tech support. You have to, you know, it's not, okay, I work from 901 to 459. No, no way. No, you don't. Right. If you're a good tech support person, mm -hmm. our company, yeah. whether it's ISF, HDMI, audio, a speaker manufacturer, right. a carburetor manufacturer, totally doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. People are getting invested in that process. Right. They have to know that there's somebody to reach out to yeah. Yeah. My, to uh, help them. One of, my, one of my calibrator buddies, he's on the West Coast, and he was doing some sort of demo in a showroom with, with some of the, one with the dealer and they were looking at uh, two different manufacturers' projectors, and they had a Kaleidoscape running through one of our switches, popping up to the two projectors. And he calls me up, he goes, dude, we're not getting HDR on either projector, but we have an HDR source and HDR content. And I go, okay, which switch is it? He told me the model number. And I said, okay, well, what input are you plugged into? He said, input one. I said, okay, hold down one. That's gonna bring up an EDID menu. Push up or down until you see an HDR EDID, then press number one again. I hear them clicking, 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 and I hear them go, okay, cool, we're good. That was at like 8 o'clock West Coast time, mm -hmm. which is 11 o'clock 11 o'clock your time. But that's what you have to He's do working. with these folks. You're yeah. working? He's working. Right, exactly. So you have to, you do have to be there for people, and I get it. You know, when I first started learning this whole weird world, um, there wasn't as many resources, you know? So I like to kind of be that person no, and, that I uh, didn't uh, always have when I was And unfortunately, up. the few resources that were out there, a lot of the companies have scaled that back, I think. Totally. And totally. are the guys who've retired? I mean, the people Absolutely. that have the, the history, that understand how we got to where we are. Right. They're not young anymore. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's funny because we're actually going through um, the, if you, go to, if you go to imagingscience.com and you type in the city or state you live in, it'll pull up a list of calibrators. So if you're interested in hiring somebody, that's a good place to find them. Also, Artings has a nice list too. Who? Artings. R T I N G S. Okay. They, those guys have a nice list going for them as well. So um, when we're going through that list, um, I'm constantly calling people to check in on them. Hey, Make sure I, they're still in the business. Yeah. Hey, I saw you went to class in 2014. Just checking in, seeing how you were doing. Um, and they go, Oh, I don't do that anymore. I retired, and now I, you know, live on my boat and fish every day. Okay, cool. So to your point, yeah, a lot, huh. of, a lot of the guys who started doing it in the 90s are getting to a point now where they're retiring or maybe they decided to do something different and they don't do that anymore. But I, what I'm really happy to see is there's a, a, a younger crowd right now. I'm desperately needed. Up. And um, at our last New York class, we had a guy in the class who's 19 years old. Wow. And um, when I, Joel always referred to me as one of the youngest guys, you know, but when I went through, I was like 23, 24. And at the time that was young. But I'm seeing that age now constantly. <laughs> and how old are you now? 41. Yeah. <laughs> you know, nothing nice I can hey, share I'm with you. I'm getting there. There's some, there's some grace coming in. There's grace coming in. Again, nothing <laughs> nice I can share with you right now. Um, We're on camera. I think what's happening, and maybe you can chime in on this to, to sort of see, see if this makes any sense, but um, a lot of the YouTube reviewers, mm -hmm. people who want nice pictures on nice TVs, the information is so accessible now on how to do this kind of stuff. And it's really, gamers especially, gamers want their TV to be as good as possible. Not only just latency wise, but if the black level's wrong in a video game and you're playing competitively or just for fun with a friend, you're gonna get shot by some guy hiding in a shadow that you never saw. So the, the gamers are really into this too. And it's kind of, um, it's inspiring to me to see this younger crowd coming up, getting interested in what we oh, do. Oh, we're seeing, and not just on that, you know, it's Adam, the, the buddy that's normally standing yeah. where you are, is 30. Yeah, right, exactly. And I'm just thrilled to death because, let's face it, as you age, you do tend to get a little narrower oh, for sure. in your vision. For sure. Not a good thing, but a reality. Having somebody there that's not this, but yeah. is this, yeah. and in fact, why are you doing it that way, yeah. Brent? Yeah, yeah. Is awesome. Yeah, and you know, it's, I learned from some of these guys. They go, hey, did you see this in the LG OLED? And I go, no. And they're like, yeah, dude, check this out. And I'm like, sweet. No, yeah, and it's not like you don't know all the manufacturers. Yeah, right. And they're still not, it's like, right. it's, it's not uncommon for the US not to know what Korea's done either. Somebody stumbles on it by accident. Yep, exactly. Like when the LG OLEDs were new, perfect example, 
um, the OLEDs, if the image is still for a minute or two, the power supply goes, oop, nope, I don't want to have image retention in this panel, so bew, down we go in, in brightness. And as soon as you hit a button or the scene changes or you unpause, then the screen gets bright again. Um, great protection for a consumer TV in a home, but not so much in a studio. When you're looking at a movie and it's a $50 million production, you can't run the risk of color grading your movie on a screen that goes dim on its own. So when this all was new with OLED, somebody figured out, oh man, if you get a service remote and go into the service menu, you can turn off the dimming. So somebody, By the way, I do have the LG service so, yeah, remote. Yeah. You gotta have that. I usually have it right here um, in the pocket, not anyway. Um, so the, the, the guys are finding these things in the service menu and we're going, holy crap. So one person finds it and all of a sudden everybody knows. So we're getting this sort of tribal knowledge from the experienced guys and then we're getting these new tips from some of the younger kids who are just going in and now being... is there a place for people to share these tips there are um it's is it something you don't want to put out on video it, it, it you can say no it depends and i hate saying that because everything always depends right but no those are diapers if the, <laughs> there you go if there's if there's a risk of voiding a warranty or doing something that might cause permanent damage to a don't TV, do it i say don't do it i say do it at your own risk, if anything. <laughs> and not um, on your customers. Yeah, exactly. And do not practice on your customers' TVs, absolutely. Um, but there's a lot of information out there. Um, I know like on the Meridia website, we have forums with some tips and tricks and things like that. And people do chime in. Um, a lot of it's on YouTube, believe it or not. Um, I mean, there's at least a dozen YouTubers that have come through our class to, to really get certified and really understand. One of them just got a gig with a really famous calibrator in Hollywood. So he tinkered with it for a few years, went to class and got certified and landed a really good gig calibrating good monitors in Hollywood. Right, exactly. And he's probably, I can't remember exactly, but I think he's 25 years old or so. Really? I mean, Not it's, so good for you. It's, it's I got awesome. nothing nice to say. You know, but, but just seeing the younger crowd and, and being able to share some of the old knowledge with the new knowledge and, and, and just adding more tricks to my book and teaching them tricks that I've always learned and known and stuff like that. We're getting just this really interesting thing going on right now in the calibrator world where uh, you know, the, the methods are getting better, the time spent, depending on how deep you're going, you, know, you can get a calibration done now in 20 minutes or four hours. Mm. You can do a lot of good damage in 20 minutes. <laughs> and, and if you really want to take it to the next level, you can sit there for well, a few let's hours talk and really about, Do you want to plug any of your tools into this TV? Does yeah, it matter? We, we totally can. Um, I just need an HDMI cable coming out of that TV. And what I'll show you are some technical test patterns and then we'll take a look at some, you know, real world practical images because it all is the same at the end of the day. Let's see. I think that's one. Let's let's talk about getting old and not being able to read input <laughs> numbers on TVs. So, okay. So, we'll start off with something very simple that everybody has seen over the years. And that's the Simpty color bars. My first the first time I ever saw the Simpty color bars was as a young kid, broadcast would end at 11 o'clock or midnight, you would see this and you would hear one kilohertz test tone. Now, my perspective is a little different. My grandfather had a TV radio did repair shop. Did yours just go off? It did, okay. no, there it goes. My grandfather had a TV radio repair shop as a kid after he retired from his real job, which was building radio stations. He did TV radio repair. So I grew up with looking at test patterns like this as a kid. But either way, this is a test pattern that you would look at to adjust color and tint. Now, I've, I very much remember this because in every one of the shootouts, right. they talk about the gradients down here, which yep. I do not see on my... Yep. And I can tell it's there's a lot going on here, not just that. <laughs> but um, Now, we'll just take a look at some real basic things, right? Okay. So, if I go into the menu of this TV... I hate that remote, by the way. You know, after I got used to it, I kind of love it. <sighs> I can just point and go and it's all good. So, number one, you're in energy savings mode. Okay, so we don't get, want to be in that. Let's get rid of that. And so everyone can see the full menu and hopefully you kind of can. We'll look at this LG TV and you'll see that there are several different picture modes to pick from. Vivid is what you'd see in the store. Oh, you know, which obviously I've never pressed this button because is that semi pre-calibrated? You're on the right path. So Vivid is your store mode. See if this really shows up on camera. APS is your power saving mode, which it does change a little bit. Obviously with our eyes, it's a much more drastic change. Yeah, you guys are even on the 4K camera, which is down rest to right. 1080, you're exactly. losing on So you, you have a few other really interesting modes down here. You have one called Cinema, which is a mode that we like. One called Filmmaker. 
and then you have ISF Bright, ISF Dark. Uh, we've been partners with LG. ISF's been partnered with LG for many years, and these modes have been in here for a really long time. Um, going back to Pioneer, Pioneer had an ISF mode right. in the plasmas, right? But there was a lot of work on Joel's part to make this stuff happen. Right, exactly. Which I, 2018 CD Lifetime Achievement Award. It deserved it. If it weren't for Joel, and not even the ISF TVs, all TVs, we would still be doing things in the service menu. We would still be, it still wouldn't be as good. He's had so, so much to do with that. So when we look at these modes, um, if you look at ISF bright and dark, what that means is if I go into that mode, every single setting that I need to fully calibrate this TV is there. Oh, so it's not preset. It's just giving you the options. It gives us what we need, where you need to, to go. do it, right? Okay. And is it closer than Vivid or Energy? Yes. It's a good starting point, right? Um, and there's this big, mis this big misconception out there, and I've heard this so many times, and it makes me like go, Ugh. oh, it's an ISF TV, just put an ISF mode, it's calibrated. Eh. It's to start calibrating, that's where you start. So it's just giving you a bigger toolbox to work with. Thank you. Nothing's grayed out, everything is here. I go into advanced controls, here's my white balance adjustments. I can do white balance in several different ways, depending on how crazy I want to go. We go color management. We have every single individual primary and secondary color here, and I can adjust everything about that color. So if we just going into the ISF mode and going back here and turning off, try to remember exactly where it's at. Energy savings is already off in that mode, which is good. Um, the ambient light sensor is already off in that mode. And one other thing I want to point out is we go to oops we go to additional settings over yeah back to here. that remote yeah exactly um we have oops, so let's well that. go back there a second let's talk about when i just saw instant game response ah yes does that give up some color capabilities to give you faster refresh it does not okay um, but it does give you the faster refresh which is nice um, on that note i do have to point this out because it's really exciting for us um for the longest time you couldn't calibrate game mode because the idea is low latency, right? Mm -hmm. So as soon as you start going in and fiddling with it, it's changing how the image is being processed and adding latency to it. Um, starting about two years ago, we can fully calibrate game modes now, okay. which is awesome. Because if you have a gamer who really wants to see shadows and really wants to see the correct color and wants the fast response, we can give it to them now. So good, thank you, thanks for pointing that out. Uh, the other thing we want to take a look at here too is picture options. And from the factory, the true motion, which is the extra motion interpolation that we all love or not, um, that's on, right? So just by doing a couple things, we go into one of the ISF modes, there's bright and dark, depending on your room lighting. Okay, now obviously this is a bright room. Yep, turn off the energy savings, turn off the motion. Okay. That is such a dramatic Yeah, well, let's turn that off. Change. Now that may be why I go into, uh, into screensaver mode when we're... It could be, the screensaver, you can kind of adjust the settings on that too, but. Um, okay, so let's take a look at this color and tint thing. If we take the color control, and I don't know how well this will show up on camera, but we'll see it here for sure. We go to the color saturation control. This is the main color control for the entire picture. Now I'll take it just to exaggerate, and we're gonna crank it up to 100 right away. And I want you to just kind of watch, especially watch the red bar. Did you see it change? Yeah. Quite dramatically. So we look at that. Yeah, it looks that. like a Sony now. Yeah. So we look at that and we go, oh my gosh, look how. Look see. at all the color we got. Look at how bright the red is, right? Yeah, I can actually see it on camera pretty well. So here's what happens. Wow, the test pattern looks so much more colorful. Great. Now what happens when we actually look at a practical image? So we'll go here to one of my favorite. Is this your skin tones? This is my skin tone image. The, the girls and the. Yeah, I like to call it the family portrait. We have varying skin tones. The primary and secondary colors are in their clothing. The grayscale is in the background. There's a lot I can do with just this test pattern. Oh, he's orange. Right, so we got an orange guy over here, and I don't know if you can see it on camera. There's some wrinkles down here by her wrist. They're not all there. Um, this guy's orange, everybody's orange. It's way oversaturated, it just looks silly, right? So you're looking at the test pattern, and you're going, oh, cool, it looks so much more colorful. Then you look at actual content, and you go, oh my God, this looks, this looks ridiculous. So the color control is basically how much color is in the image. We'll go back here and we'll look at the color bars again. We'll put that back to where it should be. And we'll look at the tint control, which people have seemed to not understand what the tint control does. It's really simple. 
So with color saturation, we're changing how much color is in the picture. So let's put that back to 50, where it's at from the factory. Turn that bad boy down. Actually, you can grab it and go faster here. And 48, 49, 50. Okay, now if we go to the tint control, you should be able to see this on camera really well. You can go left or you can go right. Watch the yellow bar. I'm going to go all the way to the left. Turns on. Turns wow. Orange. Well, the, the green's completely changed too. Right. So that goes from blue to green. Is the is the the yellow shift is the yellow is moving to the right when you do that? Watch the yellow when I go the other way. The, the yellow is moving to green. the left. Yeah. yeah, it looks green. So what's happening is, and maybe in the the recorded version of this, um, I, we can maybe show a screenshot or something. Um, and I'm mad at myself for not having it with me. But when we look at the the visible light chart that we sort mm -hmm. of talked about before, right? If you take that tint control, it's twisting all of the colors around white. So yellow goes towards orange or yellow goes towards green. That's how the tint control works. And that's a strange thing for people to see because they've probably never pushed that button on their TV before. And if they did, they didn't know what was actually going on. What was, remember the old days it was hue. Same thing. It's hue is tint. It's the same thing. Okay. Interchangeable terms. The manufacturers don't all hang out at dinner and say, hey guys, let's all call it this. I wish. Yeah and HDR in the early days, CEC all had different names. Everything, man. So let's take that same tint control. Let's see what it does to skin tones. Go all the way to the left. Okay, they get purplish. Yep, go all the way to the right. Okay. Everybody looks green. They look like Vulcans. Yep, there is a correct position for this setting to make sure the skin tones look correct. And in the ISF mode, again, it's a good starting point, it's right. It's also right in cinema mode. It's also right in filmmaker mode. So why do we have an ISF dark and bright mode? Well, I might be calibrating for somebody who has a room that's dark sometimes and bright sometimes. All right, so they can just select it depending on whether or not they're watching a movie at night or, or sporting events during the day. Or if I go from watching Game of Thrones to South Park and all of a sudden South Park is like killing my eyes, I can use my darker mode. So it's, it's room lighting mainly, but it's also, do I have Content. a headache today? Do I want a bright TV or a dark TV? Mm. What content am I watching? So there's a few different ways to, to use it, which I think is great. Um, now, if you're not doing a day mode and night mode, I don't need a day mode in my house. I only watch at night, and I sit five feet away from the TV with no lights on in the room. So You're from, a sad individual. I know. It's really, yeah. It's, Just say it. Um, tell, tell me, is there, is there a glass of scotch in your hand? Usually red wine. Okay. Okay. Whole nother, that's a whole other webcast. You are a sad <laughs> man. I know, it's pretty bad. But um, you, have, you have a girlfriend. I do. And she's getting into the wine a little bit now. I've, I've kind of converted her. Yeah. She's always been white wine or white Having paws, just, but. I spent last week in Napa. Yeah, oh yeah, you I told me I did six that. winery tours, and let me tell you. Yeah. Here's Brent's wine scale. Yeah. Incredibly offensive. Yeah. Offensive, slightly less offensive. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that covers all the wines in the world for me. I was telling you to take notes on my phone about movie scenes. I have notes on my phone about wines, wines. too. And it's, bourbons and scotches. It's, yeah, it's... it's The it's, wine thing doesn't get it. It's, so, it's crazy. Back back yep. to the winos. So, um, I just, I did want to mention that the filmmaker mode and the cinema mode are also very good modes, right? Out of the box. Out of the box. Um, if you were just going to calibrate, like, one mode and you didn't care about a day mode, calibrate cinema mode, calibrate filmmaker mode, or calibrate ISF dark mode. Totally okay. up to you. You have that freedom to do and whatever you want. Real quick question, but sure. one of the things that was added this year was an out-of-the-box mode. Yes. In the test. Now, I had to step out to do some calls. How did that go? Um, I'm trying to remember what you might be referring to. Because they were supposedly going to reset all the TVs to yeah. factory resets. Yeah. Factory out-of-the-box mode just to right. compare them. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, what we do um, when we're testing a TV... Um, well, this was at the shootout. Right. We And we do this not just at the shootout, but we do this kind of all the time anyway. If you put a supercharger on your car, you want to know the horsepower before and after. Same with the TV. So we measure the TV out of the box, whatever mode it's in, whatever mode I found it in, and then we calibrate it and measure it again at the end. Okay. So when I spit out a report for the customer or for the studio or whoever I'm calibrating for, I have a before and after with the performance charts and with all the before and after numbers. So if something, excuse me, if something happens, I can go back into this picture mode and I can say, okay, well, somebody hit reset at some point, right. so let's fix it. 
So I look at my report and I say, okay, the backlight needs to be at 78, because that's where we calibrate. Contrast should be at 84. So we can go through, because we have a record of what the settings should be, we can pop those settings back in, which is really cool. Um, and that's kind of worst case scenario. I've only had to do it a few times over the years, but um, regardless of what mode you're in, you have all of these settings to work with. And like I said, ISF dark, filmmaker What are advanced mode. and picture options? Ah, okay. So the controls that we're all used to and we've all grown up with with color TV, not backlight, because CRTs didn't have that, but LCDs do. Contrast, white yes. level. Brightness, black level. Sharpness is for edge enhancement. Color saturation we looked at, tint we looked at. Those are the five controls that we all have grown up with, right? But now, with the TVs being as advanced as they are, we can go into advanced controls. Oh! And we have a whole bunch of new stuff. So I'll show you one good example. I'm going to pull up a test pattern that's pure white. So right here. You're going to have a white rectangle in the middle of the screen. Let's let that sync back up. We go to this menu called white balance. Now the point is to make that white reference correct white. Okay. And if we look at that color chart that I did not bring because I Why saw. would you? Yeah, exactly. Um, we have a specific shade of white that we're always aiming for because that's how the content's mastered. Okay, now is this just like a color swatch card that you have at the paint store? Sort you, of. You put up there next to it? Sort of, um, and, and that's how it was in the early days. Um, when, I, when I talked to some of the old school calibrators, um, they would have a tool called an optical comparator. And it would be a little magic box with a perfect D65, perfect white light in it. And they would look at the white on the TV, adjust, go look at the <laughs> magic box, and they try to get them matched up. Now we have stuff like this, which helps our jobs to be a lot easier. But point being, when I'm trying to make the right shade of white, I have three colors to pick from, red, green, and blue. That's what white's made of. So I'll just show you an example, and this might show up on camera. If I take the green control in the white balance, and I'm going to add green to it, tell me what you see, Brent. Well, it starts to shift to the little green side. You start to get almost like a kind of a lemonade, limeade yeah. color. Okay, now let me take out all the green. We'll go to the other extreme, and you tell me what you're seeing. We're almost back to the factory position. Once we get into the negatives, you'll really start to see it change. And maybe this is on camera, but... It's starting to get pinkish. Turns to turn pink, right? Yeah. So, here's the point. Some combination of these red, green, and blue controls is going to make the right shade so of white. So, it's, like, it's just like dealing with uh, red, green, and blue in uh, Microsoft Paint or Photoshop or... Same thing, man. It's the same thing. So, some combination mm -hmm. of these controls are going to give me the right white. And you have to think about this, too. You're n we're not always calibrating to a film or it's technically, this all belongs in the, the International Telecommunications Union, the ITU. Um, they're like the international group that says, hey, here's what blue is when we're talking about TV production, video production. If I watch a movie in Canada, it should look the same in the States. So right? that's, the, that's their version of Pantone? These are, yeah, these are the rules, right? So we don't always have to follow the rules. If we're doing a video wall in an airport, we might intentionally want to go with a much bluer white point because you're fighting giant the, glass right, the windows lights and the stuff, outside right? right. So just keep in mind that you know there's lots of applications for calibration. Just like audio. Thank you. That's we keep going back to that because it's just so true. So I have a couple of different things here. I've got my white balance adjustments. Here's another cool trick: apply to all inputs. Right. So I don't have to calibrate every input individually. And then we have something called the color management system. So here I can pick red, green, blue, cyan, magenta, yellow. Those are the primary and secondary colors. And just so we can see a very easily see what happens on the screen here, we'll go back to those color bars. And I want you to tell me. You know where those color bars are, don't you? Oh, yeah. It takes some practice and it takes a lot of looking at them to just be able to look at those alone and tell what might be going on. But in any event, we'll go to the yellow control and I'm going to take the tint control for yellow. Now, remember okay. when we changed the tint control before it changed everything? Mm -hmm. Watch what happens when I do it this time. What do you see happening to the well, yellow bars? Well, it's turning bars? slightly greenish. What's happening to the rest of the bars? They're staying static. They're staying the same, right? So the point is, is I can tune white to whatever white I need, and then I can tune each individual color to whatever those need to be as well. 
and you don't... Now, is this common across most manufacturers' panels, or is this an LG deal? It's gotten a lot better with the other manufacturers, but LG was one of the first to really embrace this, and they've done a really good job at it for years. Um, Sony does it now. Um, Samsung's also done it for a really long time. Um, we see these more advanced menus in Vizios now, and even some of the TCLs. The TCLs are a little tricky because you have to use the app to get to mm -hmm. all the settings, but in a lot of cases, they're there, which what is What about cool. projectors? Um, different beast, but... At the end of the day, it's the same thing. It's a okay. giant television, right? Um, there's a lot more things in a projector system that you have to worry about. There's more mechanics going on. There's irises opening and closing. Um, the screen material, screen size, right. room lighting, these things all work together. Uh, we're dealing with lasers now, and there's still some lamp-based projectors so out there. But before you get too deep into that, yeah. ISFing a projector versus a flat panel, more money? Um, tends to be. Okay. Um, because there's a lot more, more time. involved and a lot more time involved. Um, but with a flat panel, it's a flat panel. It's going to be pretty much the same as far as how you calibrate it. In a projection system, if I go into a room that has way too big of a screen, that's going to be a lot more challenging to calibrate because I don't have enough light bouncing off the screen because the screen's so much of a surface area. Well, and very few people think about their the projector versus the screen. It's like, right. how big can I fit on this wall? And, and when you look at projector specs, um, it's always funny because uh, one manufacturer specifically off the top of my head, it says in the specs, you can produce a 30 to 300 inch image. So what does everybody try to do? 300 inches, baby. Meanwhile, after about 100 inches, the picture gets so dim, it's unwatchable. So you have 100 to 300 inches of unusable picture. So you've got to keep but the lens, screens the, the, under, those, under You know, control. if you push the projector in the next room. Yeah, right, yeah. And turn the zoom all the way out again if you 300 and you may see something yeah so it meets the definition it, it it definitely meets the spec right but the the light loss that comes with the cost of such a big screen it it's 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 unwatchable what level of light do you want at the screen at the screen mm -hmm. um so if we're following like what you'd see in a commercial cinema um it's uh, uh if we're talking about measurement and light units it's uh, about 14 foot lamberts Okay. So imagine that you're in a um, in a commercial environment. Think about how bright that image is. In consumer and in home theater, we can destroy that number. I right, because it, it's a lot smaller screen. It's a lot smaller. A lot better screen. control. Yes, and you're not dealing with all the shortcomings of a theater, and mainly its size. Uh, what commercial theaters are really good at is light control, so that helps a lot too. But if, um, and if you just do the math really quick, if you want to think about it in nits, I, off the top of my head, I, I just don't have it memorized, but it's uh, 14 times 3.4, and that gives you how, how many nits it is. So if I take a 120 inch screen, and it's, let's say 50 nits, same projector, same room, same screen, just smaller, I might be 80 nits. So the screen size is so incredibly important. Right, because the, the bigger the screen, the more the light's spread out, so the smaller the given area is. Right, exactly. So. When I go to these really high-end home theaters that I work on, tend to work on a lot of times, um, my first question is, what projector is it? How much control do you have over the lighting in the room? And what's the shape and size of the screen? Because there are some red flags in there, depending on what, the, what those answers are. And I've had to kindly decline jobs before. Because there's no way you're gonna make it right. There's no way that I can make an 1800 lumen projector look good on a 240 inch screen. It's just not gonna happen. And I don't, the last thing I want is for my customer or a lot of dealers bring me in on jobs. I don't want them calling the dealer and saying, hey, you had this Jason guy out to calibrate the projector. It looks like crap. I, I don't want to put my name on that, right? But when the stars are aligned, we have the right size screen. We have the right shape screen for masking and things like that. The room is nice and dark. We have a projector that's powerful enough to light up that screen. It's really, really, really fun. Now, does ISF offer any guidelines in their website or individually um, to help a, to help a dealer work their way through this yeah. and not put themselves in a position of yeah, yeah that combination is not good not specifically on the isf website but i, I will tell you some good resources that i know uh, projectorcentral.com yep rob saban and that team um, it's really hard to predict how bright a picture is going to be but they usually guess pretty well so you can go into that website and you can type in the projector that you're using, mm -hmm. the size of the screen. And they'll give you a bar, good idea, and they bad give idea. You pretty much. Yep. And for the most part, it's it's good. Um, where it gets a little weird is 
Um, the screen manufacturer, they all do things a little bit differently. Um, how much gain the screen is throwing back or sucking in light. Um, you can put the level of gain of the screen in that calculator and it does a pretty good job, but it'll at least give you an idea of what's gonna happen. I'm finding screen materials made giant leaps in the past few years too. Dude. I'm still running, I'm running a Black Diamond 2 at my house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Which nowadays is an antique material. Mm -hmm. um, we just did our last ISF class um, over at Stewart Film Screen in Torrance, California. And they took us through a tour of their facility and showed us exactly how they do everything. And one of the employees for Stuart, he's their lead chemist who makes the screens and, and decides what to coat them in. He sat through our course, which I thought was awesome. Great guy. And just having conversations with him about what goes in to how they choose the material is, is unbelievably complicated, which really blows my mind why, when, when I see a, a, someone buy a projector and they shoot it up onto the wall or they hang a sheet yep. and, you know, in your college dorm room with all your buddies. Cool, right? But that's not the right way to do it. Um, but I even see a lot of times, even in a, in a, in a home theater system, it's a do-it-yourself system or something yep. like that. Or a cheap screen. or Yeah, they buy a cheap screen, which is okay. I get it. You're dealing with a budget. But you got to balance that out with the rest of the system, too. You can't just go buy some really nice projector, put it in a really dark room, and put a crappy screen in, and now you're not getting the experience that you were hoping to get. Yep. So projectors, yeah, it does cost a little bit more to calibrate them because there's so many more moving parts to it. But... Um, I was helping a guy with a, a Sony projector just the other day on, on either Friday or Monday. Um, it was a Sony um, 715. Which is a great projector. For the money, holy crap, that thing is nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's devastatingly good for it, the money. It really is. Um, I don't remember the screen exactly. Um, it was a SI... Um, I forget the model. That's the problem. Most of these manufacturers now got 15 or 20 different... Yeah. Screen materials. Right, exactly. Um, different applications, of course. If I'm trying to light up a amphitheater versus a home theater, you know, it's a little different. But um, Sony 715 projector, um, the screen was 106 or 110, so not okay, too Okay, which is reasonable. Um, Mine's 110. Yeah. Um, that projector, I think, is about 2,000 lumens, something like that, if I remember correctly. Uh, the room was dark. It was a dedicated theater room. The walls were black. The it's really close to the next model up with more money. Right. Yeah, that's yeah, good point. Um, the carpet was like a really dark, deep red. The ceiling was a really dark gray. The room was really nice. So I'm helping the calibrator. I'm looking at his screen through TeamViewer uh, or through Microsoft Teams, and I'm kind of guiding him through it. It was his first projector, and we're going through it, and I'm like, yeah, man, this thing's like dialing in really, really well. And at the end of it, we were at 96 nits. To give you a frame wow. of reference. Now that's a bright projection picture. Right. And to give you a frame of reference, when standard dynamic range is mastered, it's 100 nits on a 32 inch monitor. So take that same amount of brightness and blow it up to 106 or 110 inches, it's awesome. And because that's, that projector in particular has a really good control over the iris, you can make the blacks really, really, really good for a projector and still see shadow details because you adjusted your black level correctly with your test pattern. So he's sitting there looking at it. And he's like, I've never seen one this good before. And he sells a lot of Sony's. And I was like, yeah, because we sat here for 90 minutes and really dialed it in, which had a lot to do with it. But the room combination with the screen and the projector, that is really the secret sauce right there. And then what we do afterwards is just the fine tuning and just the color correction. So it's a whole big square or triangle of a, of a lot of different things happening at once. And in a dedicated theater room with a projector, if you get everything right, it's, it's so special. I mean, yeah, you can look at a 65 inch OLED. It looks really good, but watching something in a theater something like that, immersive. It's, it's, it's just such a different experience. Um, then we start talking about different aspect ratios and widescreen and that's a Two, whole three, other five, thing. But and yeah, but, but watching a movie in the right shape that it was made in, that's really fun too. I mean, there's, there's a whole lot more to it when you talk about theaters and projectors. Any more questions? It's almost 430. Oh, oh, good. Wow. So All right. talk about this. Yeah. So what I need to do when I'm measuring a television, like we looked at white before, mm -hmm. I need to know exactly what shade of white that is. And that's what this little guy is for. When I use this little light meter, I put it up on a tripod, aim at the screen. So how far? Because it used to be right next to the yep. screen. On a flat panel, I want to get right up on it. Okay. Because I want to eliminate any sort of ambient light right. coming in. With a projector, if I put this right up on the screen, yeah, dark season, no picture. Now the light is hitting the meter, mm -hmm. and I'm shining the, I'm, I'm aiming the meter into my, uh, into into its own shadow. So in the projection system, you get the meter, 
Um, it, with this particular guy right here, you can get as far as you want, which is nice. Uh, there's a laser pointer here, so I know exactly where I'm aiming. Um, we've used these in commercial cinemas before where you're way, way, way in the back. Um, but, you know, in, in typical situations, the last one I did, it was probably six feet away. No now, big deal. The tools to do ISF have dropped in price since the early days, I oh believe. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Because um, the hardware to do ISFing used to be... Yeah. Expensive. Um, you probably remember the gray Sencor generator with the buttons on the yeah. front. Um, that generator was six thousand dollars. In my first one was in like two thousand seven or so. Um, this little guy right here is about twenty five hundred bucks, and it does, and does way it more. <laughs> you know, which is which is really cool. Well, in four K, which the Sencor didn't. Right. Exactly. And Sencor also didn't do HDMI. We gotta use a DVI to HDMI adapter. I still got a stack of those at the house. Somewhere, yeah, somewhere in a drawer. Somewhere. Oh no, I saw them last night. It's like, <laughs> oh, nice. the hell do I still Why have, do I these? have these? Yeah, exactly. Seriously. Um, I'll put it to you this way: these, I have high-end tools because I teach it, I do it a lot, um, and I've done it a long time, and, and I find value in, in, in the high-end tools. We'll talk about this one here in just a second. But here's the really good news: if you're starting out, or if you've been into this a while, and you just need to update your tools, you can get an entire kit with the generator, with the software, with a couple of nice meters for about six grand. I'm gonna do a top down real quick. And that's for everything. Yeah, so here's one style meter. I'll turn it on so you guys can kind of see the little screen right here. But what's really cool about this meter is I can take it, let's actually do it. I can take this meter and I can shoot yellow And I can tell within a few seconds exactly what yellow that is. So once it's done taking its reading, it does take a few seconds. Now I've got... You can hold it up to the camera. Oh, now I've got some numbers on the screen. So I know exactly what shade of yellow yeah, that is. That's not easy, is it? So when... I know what yellow it should be, and I know it's actually coming off the TV, I can fix it. Wow. You saw the red control and right. the yellow control, I can go fix it now, which is nice. This all ties together with some software. Uh, this, this meter's kind of special. Do you generally still use Calman? Yeah, there's, there's two out there that most calibrators use. Uh, one is Calman by a company called Portrait Displays. Uh, that's what most people use, especially for residential and even some commercial stuff. There's another software package out there from a company called Light Illusion. It's called Color Space. Um, it's a lot more custom. You can do a lot more with it, which is why a lot of the studio folks like it. But those are really like the two, the two big ones right there. Um, so um, considering uh, software, your light meters, your signal generator to get test patterns up on the screen, you can get into it for about six grand, wow. which, is, which is crazy because just the generator used to be six grand. Uh, so. You're right. The prices have come way down. The TVs are much easier to work on these days. Because they actually have the ability to get there. Right. Exactly. Um, so I always, I always kind of joke about this, but when the younger guys are getting into this, I'm like, you guys have it so lucky. You know? Well, okay. Not for nothing. We say the same thing about automation. Let's think about when I first started in, in automation, you literally had to open a device and put your own relays in, yep. your own solenoids in, mm -hmm. to move mechanical yep. functions. That was what you now did. Now you click a couple of mouse you know, Now there's Control and 4 and <laughs> Crestron yep. and, you know, there's any number, Tuya yeah. and we were, um, Alexa. And I was sticking IR emitters for URC remotes on Blu-ray players and cable boxes. Oh, no, and we were opening the units up and putting them inside yeah, so you didn't see them. That's cool. Yeah, that's, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's just so much easier these days. Um, and I, I do want to cover if we can maybe take two minutes to do this. Sure. Why do I have two meters? This is a big I don't know. Piece. Why do you have two meters? This is an important part of it. Um, there's two styles of meter. One is a spectroradiometer, and that's a fancy word, a fancy way of describing. When I read a color with this meter, mm -hmm. it's going to tell me within two nanometers exactly what the frequency and the amplitude of that light is. It's extremely accurate. But what you may have noticed a moment ago it took me 15, 20 seconds right. to read yellow, which is a bright color. So it's insanely accurate, but insanely slow. So how do I get through a job, make it accurate, but also get through it in a reasonable amount of, amount of time? Now, is that because of the price of the unit that you give up processing power? 
you speed you give up speed for accuracy okay so the reference meter that these calibrate to in a lab it's a Minolta it's called a CS2000 I've seen that at the shows it's a big giant suitcase size with a giant lens on the front of it it's accurate down to one nanometer and it can take up to six minutes to take a reading but it's down to one nanometer it is insanely accurate double as accurate as that one which is already really accurate so how do I get the accuracy and how do I get the speed if it takes me three or four hours to calibrate a TV, that's enough time already. I don't want to sit there for six or eight hours. So how do we speed up the process? A meter like this, this is called a tri-stimulus colorimeter. So basically the way this guy takes in light, it's just like our eyes. Light comes in, breaks it off into red, green, and blue, spits out a number. But it's nowhere near as accurate as this guy. But it's way faster. And because of its length and the sensor's way back here, it's like a camera, a nice big sensor. I can shoot dark, dark, dark test patterns and still it can still see them. So what is that? 95% of what that is as far as capabilities um, versus speed? It's, 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 so, it's so crazily much faster that you, you really want to do this to actually do the job. But if I can take my software, whether it's CalMan or ColorSpace, I can take some samples with this meter mm -hmm. and take the same samples with that meter and in either case with either software package it makes an offset so now this little guy is as accurate as that guy but ten, faster literally 10 times the speed we cost did, um so this is crazy stuff um mm -hmm. when we get into this level you're talking between the two about 17 grand okay but if you had to pick one that you would go with the 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 white and black one the faster one which is what i did when i started doing this i had both styles of meters at a much more reasonable price and that's what i sort of mentioned before for about six grand so those two light meters are very good but if i'm doing two or three calibrations a day i need to go fast right yes because you got to figure drive yep. time and setup it's all it's all part of it right Especially if I'm going from Tampa to, you know, Sarasota, you know, it, it, all that time counts. Or Jacksonville. Or Jacksonville, exactly. Um, so what I did at first, I still had my two meters. I replaced one of them with this one to go faster. And the main reason I went with this one to replace the other ones made by x ray it's called an I1 Pro 3, great little meter for the money. It's also a spectroideometer. It's 10 nanometers instead of two, so not quite as accurate, but 1600 or 1200 dollars versus 8600 dollars great meter to start with the main reason i got it i do like the screen i like to be able to point at something and just tell right away without having my laptop and all the software open but we have a lot of projectors now and most of them are going to be laser based mm -hmm. so most of the time the lasers are about four nanometers maybe a little bit less i can't really trust a meter that's reading 10 meters, 10 meters wide. If 10 I'm nanometers. trying to read something that's four. But if I use something that's reading at two, I know the my- four is easy. Four is easy, exactly, if you have two to work with. So that was really the main reason. Um, if there hadn't been all this laser-based stuff in the past two years, I'd probably still be using my i1 Pro 2. It's a, again, it's a great meter for the money. Um, the other thing we're starting to see too are the, the quantum dots. Some of those TVs have these really sharp mm -hmm. spikes in the spectral response, and you need something a little more there to really read those. Uh, but but that's really the, the whole thing. I mean, it took me years to build up to this. I had to do a lot of jobs and save a lot of money. And I think I'm at my um, kind of my, my end goal for now, at least. For the next few years? At least. I mean, so nothing's really going to change. If you're not supporting 8K, this does everything the ISF -er needs for gen signal generation? Yes. So we do have an 8K version of this available you do. now. Yep. Um, so this is the 4K version. Really? We have an 8K version. Yeah. There's a little 8K version of this guy. Really? The 8K 6G. This is the 4K 6G. Um, this is a little I obviously bit of, need to talk to my R R Meridio rep. Only if you knew a guy. Yeah. Um, I wonder why I haven't got one yet. This this will this will sort of round out the package. Um, that's a generator. This is an analyzer. Right, which I can promise you is an awesome tool to have. If, if I were an integrator, I would absolutely 100% have these two. Yep. Um, or there's or a slightly a less smaller, expensive version thank you but I got to be honest with you those two are I like the usability of the less expensive ones because right. they're less intensive to right <laughs> smaller yeah right in fact I think Do you have one 
somewhere in there, maybe? Oh, it's Deerser Spears and Munsell disc. Yes, it is. Oh, there they are. Mm. That's not the new Spears and Munsell disc, though. The new, new one's coming. We got a yes. sneak peek at the, at the shootout. Yes, we did. So, um... By the way, great tools. I do prefer the traditional 6G, but the presets are nice. Yeah, well, and let's talk about the point, right? If I have a signal generator that I can spit any kind of signal I want out to, say, a display... You might want to hold them up a little or higher. ...or through a video system, I've got my generator, I can send a signal out, I've got my analyzer, I can see the signal on the other end. Which is great when you're doing a pre-wire because you're not having to wait for the TV to get there to make sure the cable works. Well, that, and let's say you go to a retrofit job and there's a TV in the kitchen and it's hung up really high up on the wall and you don't know what it is or what its capabilities are, I can take my generator, I can set it to 4K with one button press. Mm -hmm. If the TV lights up, I know it can do 4K. If not, I can go down to 1080p, TV lights up, boom, I know it can do 1080p. And see, I'm looking, I'm from a pre-wire standpoint, I want to know stuff works before I leave well, the job. And I also want to know before I put this cable in the wall, if it can pass the bandwidth that we need for it to yep. do it. And you can do all that, which is cool. Um, which is a great thing to be able to test cables. Point being, if I go to help a dealer with a calibration, or if I'm setting up a system for a friend or, or a private client or something like that, there's so many times where I'll go and oh my gosh, this is a 4K Apple TV with HDR turned on, and this is a 4K HDR capable television, but I'm not getting the HDR logo to light up on the screen. What is going on here? So I can take my analyzer, plug it, Apple TV straight into it. Make sure it's not a settings issue. And make sure it's not set to 1080p or something mm -hmm. like that. So I can generate a signal with that guy. I can analyze the signal on the other end with that guy. So um, I don't use this as much for calibration jobs, but I have it in case I need it because it's a lifesaver. It is. <laughs> If I need um, it. So. I would certainly have one of the two sets. I prefer the flexibility of that. Yep. I honestly prefer the usability Man, of that. Th th this is so much, so much, it's so much easier to use. And, and the reason and I they're say durable. that, they're very durable. Um, we have videos of people like literally stepping on them and they still are okay. Um, not that I would go do that and not that warranty would cover that, but we've seen people do it before. Um, what I always like to do, if I'm, a lot of dealers call me out, especially around Florida, say, hey man, we're down in Sarasota. We're having this nightmare of a time with this job. The bedroom TV keeps flashing. It's a whole rack of things with matrix switch and all this other stuff. Please come help. Okay, great. I've got a suitcase with me that has mm -hmm. the Fox and Hound in it. That's what these are called. And then we also have an HD base T tester. Yes, and our Fox and Hound and those before this existed, we have sent out to numerous dealers oh, to solve to, problems. to play with, yeah. exactly. So I can so show we up. We don't to, sell them, but we yeah, know who does. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I can show up with one hard shell case, I've got my generator and analyzer, and I've got my HD base T-tester in there, and I've got a couple of reference cables that I know work, work, and I can solve pretty much any problem, or at least find what the problem is. Is, Cause there's which so is many, and, huge. And one, the, last, um, the last one I went to to help, um, they've been fighting the system for like three or four days, the picture was like flashing inconsistently in the bedroom, and it turned out the output of the switch was bad. It happens. They've been fighting with it for days. I was there for an hour. It's like, okay, well, what do we do? Let's RMA the switch, put a new switch in there, and boom, it's done. Or if, and in the meantime, do you have an available port that's still open? Move it over there. Thank you. Change your control configuration yep. a little bit with Control 4 Rock or whatever. on, and then Use contact the manufacturer, get one coming, just send that one back. Especially with the integrators, man. Time is money. And I've heard anywhere from... 100 to 350 dollars for a, a troubleshooting call yeah. for, for a truck roll yeah and imagine you're there two three times over a two three day period and, and then just the bad wrong. pr yeah oh i i paid fifty thousand dollars for this system and these guys can't figure out one tv is flashing so the tools are important whether you're color correcting for television you're 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 calibrating for a projector you're troubleshooting i mean all these tools here's here's what i always say and the car people will understand this one if I go to a mechanic and I say my check engine light's on and he doesn't plug something in and read it. Doesn't have an OBT2 I'm reader. Off to the next mechanic, yep. right? And this is he's what guessing. This is, you open the hood and you go, maybe it's this. Oh, uh, let's swap that out. Oh, it's still doing it. You know, you've got to have the right tools. And that's, that's where we live is in that troubleshooting and calibration world. So there's your 90 minute, in a nutshell, <laughs> calibration in. <laughs> yeah, 90-ish minutes. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> Do we have any other questions, Trent? No, I don't think so. Okay, then. In that case, we have gone one hour and 45 minutes, which makes you my longest show, Jason. It tends to happen, man. I get it. And it's been an absolute <laughs> blast. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I was, it was great having you, playing yeah. with the toys, seeing that. 
Hopefully you can do something with that thing. Oh yeah, we'll play with that one for a little um, bit. Since Adam's not here, we're not gonna do the usual sign off. Oh, but okay. I'm Brent with Metro AV. Jason Dusta with Meridio. Thank you for joining us. Have a great one. Um, reboot early, reboot often. Have a great day.